All right, so tonight we're going to talk about Derrida's Spectres of Marx. In my estimation, probably the most important book he wrote. And it's, it's not necessarily the book that we need to spend the most time with, because in, in many respects it builds upon, you know, the kind of philosophical analytic uh, and the development of the project of deconstruction that we see in the previous 20 years before he uh, published the book. But it's, it's a turnkey book, and by that I mean it's a book that kind of represents and registers the kind of turn that Derrida takes, so uh, we might call it a religious turn, uh, starting in the uh, late 1980s, uh, that is first foreshadowed and suggested in the book that we talked about in our seminar last week, uh, of Spirit. So we have two themes that are playing in this book. And again, you know, there's nothing that's intuitively obvious here, you know. If, if you're not uncomfortable in reading Derrida, you should be. Because this whole object is to make you uncomfortable, to, to disquiet you, to put you, he's talking about the time being out of joint, but he wants to leave you kind of disjointed, disjointed in your thinking, disjointed in your, you know, kind of anticipation of what is philosophically appropriate or even philosophically correct. Uh, and also to raise issues that Derrida really never has raised in his previous writings, that is, the issue of world history, the place of philosophy, the place of the role of what we might call the philosophical temper, as uh, Peter Sloterdijk calls it, in the estimation, imagination, uh, calculation of world history. And of course, he's writing at a very significant time in does anybody know the time that's being referenced here approximately? What's what's the what's the event? Berlin Wall. Fall of uh, the you know the fall of Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism. Um, you know, 1989 uh, was usually the year of the sign to it. Though Soviet Union fell in 1981, or communism fell, I should say. Which, you know, looking back, probably has as much kind of historical meaning and significance as any year in the last 250 years. The other years that we can count among this roster of significant years would be 1848, 1914, of course 1939, the beginning of World War II. But in terms of what we might, might call the transformative impulse, transformative impulse of world history. That would be 1968, but ultimately 1989. So you might say this, Derrida is responding to the spirit of 89. Uh, all of a sudden, we have the opening up of a kind of a prospect of a new planetary civilization the beginning of a process which had always been going on, but now has a name. That name is globalization. The sudden, you might say, not discrediting, because the discrediting is was, was a slow process, but the sort of sudden ineffectuality in the historical irrelevance of certain ideological systems. An event which had actually been anticipated by the person who defined the word postmodernism, the French philosopher Jean-Luc Leotard, uh, earlier in that decade, when he talked about the postmodern condition and the end of meta narratives. Meta narrative meaning this kind of grand story, this kind of idea of explaining all how world history is operating, the the, the place and predicament of individual human beings within this oral historical process. A kind of understanding of what might be called the, the sort of 
temporal metaphysics of, of human action and human dynamics, going all the way back to the French Revol Revolution, the fall of the Bastille, the inauguration of a new era of liberté, fraternité, and égalité. And of course, 1776 and the American Revolution, you know, bringing forth upon a con new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all people are created equal, <coughs> a la Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address and so forth. So that's, that's what we mean by the kind of meta-narrativity of history. These grand narratives that, you know, encompass everything and explain everything and, and somehow situate individual human beings and also the language of human destiny within these kind of grand narratives of history. Derrida himself wants to basically say, and I would maintain this is you know, open for discussion tonight, Derrida wants to say that this grand historical view of things is not over. You know, it's not the end of history, as the title of a best-selling famous book by a budding neocon by the name of Francis Fukuyama wrote in the early 1990s, which was actually paper that was, or an article that was published in Foreign Policy a lot like Samuel Huntington's ideas, um, that, you know, <clears throat> the term end of history, of course, was not Fukuyama's. It goes back to Alexander Kojev, uh, a kind of uh, revisionist, kind of rogue Marxist thinker who is probably most famous for the series of lectures he gave on Hegel uh, starting in the 1930s, which was in France. He was, he was actually a Russian, but he lived in France. There, was, there were rumors about whether he was really a spy for the Soviets. And there were actual claims made that he had been that was never determined one or the other. But probably what historically, other than his lectures on Hegel, which created the context for a whole new understanding of what became the humanistic Marx in relation to Hegel, or say the Hegelian Marx, that both, that inspired the new left of the 1960s and 1970s, uh, and also, in a sense, brought to prominence for the first time the Frankfurt School, people like Herbert Marcuse, uh, Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, and so forth. These these people had their moment in the sun in the 1960s when history seemed to be at this kind of boiling point, at this kind of, you know, at a turning point that really didn't come for 20 years later until the late 1980s. Uh, and Kojev's lectures on Hegel allowed a whole generation of intellectuals that we call post-structuralists, post-modernists, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, Leotard's term, that allowed a whole generation of intellectuals to rethink modernist, the modernist project in a radical new dynamic way. And Derrida belongs to that new kind of thinking of the modernist project. The other legacy we have of Kojia, who remember coined the word end of history, is something that is now in place and is also in crisis. And in many ways, it's the, the crisis which has beset it, I think, you know, points to the prophetic nature of Derrida's writing right now. You know, there really isn't, the end of what do we mean by the end of history? What we mean by the end of history is the opening up of radical possibilities that are yet to be specified. Radical possibilities that are no longer part of this metaphysical meta narrative that we call grand history. And which, in a sense, not only are deconstructing for, for our eyes, 
but are floating out like flotsam into the roiling sea of human temporality and time and so forth. What was that project that Kojev gave us that is our legacy? It's the European project, the EU. Kojev, probably more than any other person, was responsible for imagining it, naming it, working behind the scenes, using the tremendous intellectual and academic influence he had in Europe. In some ways, you say Kojev was kind of the... Um, Henry Kissinger of post-war Europe, post Europe to bring it into place, and now we see it crumbling before our eyes. And Derrida, Derrida saw through this project. He saw through any declaration of the end of history. But the irony, I think, that, that we have to point out here is the end of history for Derrida is not a dismissal of history, nor is it a dismissal of the human tendency to dream what we might call big history or a, an end to history, an end to history that is now, to use a term that I want to spend some time with tonight, because it relates back to other readings we've done, that is deferred, that is deferred from the kind of language of finality we use in any kind of meta narrativity of the end of history. A, a finality that is not ultimately final, what Derrida calls the impossible. Now it's interesting, whenever we're using the term end of history, and we're, we're, not, we're not talking really about history, we're talking about the political. And so this is Derrida's first major significant book of political philosophy, which up until, you know, its publication, Derrida had been accused, particularly by Marxists, of being apolitical, not being radical enough. Deconstruction was seen, and I remember this, you know, when I was you know, trafficking, with, trafficking with Derrida in the early 80s, among many of my old left friends, both in and out of academia, um, that Derrida was considered to be a, a secret reactionary, one who wanted to, in a sense, create this sort of alternative spirituality like many sort of New Age philosophies and epistemologies of the 1970s where you can kind of, almost like Buddhism, where you can kind of let go of all kind of intellectual, conceptual, moral commitments, and just, you know, sort of experience the flow. In fact, back in the 70s and 80s, there were quite, there were quite a few books comparing deconstruction to Buddhism, you know, to this kind of radical, critical epistemology that didn't let us dream political dreams or have political ideas that didn't really inspire revolution or the revelatory transformation of human societies and of the human condition. Yeah. If that, I mean, I, if one takes that criticism, what's the further steps that, that move from that criticism to assuming that there's some kind of letting it go Buddhism? I mean, in other words, one can kind of... Um, take the criticism and also kind of move it into a sense that there'd be some kind of a deep anxiety or some kind of a different mode of living. I'm just curious what leads people to think that if a thinker is apolitical in this sense, that it would somehow be let it all go. That doesn't follow to me. Well, I mean, I, I would maintain that few of Derrida's critics then or now have ever understood Derrida. Because in, in some ways, Derrida has been a, a Rorschach inkblot. You know, you've kind of, we've kind of projected, you know, whatever fears or fantasies or, you know, whatever resentments, intellectual resentments we've had upon him. You know, Derrida was always modest. He was always saying, you know, what he was basically saying in the 1970s, I'm, 
and I'm just about reading and writing, and that was the discourse we, we used back in those days. It's about reading and writing and texts. You know, before that, and all this happened in France, nobody in in the English-speaking world was really aware of the Derrida of the 60s and this kind of fascination and preoccupation with the, the problems that Husserl raised, you know, in his, in his phenomenology. We're now only discovering that as a kind of archive the background of, of of Derrida's work, you know, which in some ways establishes him as a serious philosopher, but which nobody considered that. But I mean, you know, there were people there were uh, scholars like Robert Margulis who wrote Derrida and the Men, which basically said that, well, you know, Derrida is a Madhyamaka Buddhist, you know, and we can we can he can find quotes about the nature of language and, you know, the nature of representation that would uh, correspond, correspond in uh, Nargarjuna and his writings and that sort of thing. You know, and remember the the early '80s was was the was the high water mark of kind of New Age spirituality. Um, it was also Ronald Reagan's Morning in America. You know, where let's leave the '60s behind and you know let's let's celebrate this kind of ideal version of American virtue in American society and. And so forth, and you know that was when you know the kind of street radicalism of the '60s, you know, kind of calcified, and you know this is the time for, you know, when you know former, you know, community organizers and street revolutionaries now get positions in English department and so forth. You know, it's the context out of which people like Terry Eagleton, Stanley Fish, and you know. Frederick Jameson all came and so forth. You know, all who were sort of critics of, of Derrida, at least what they thought Derridianism was. You know, and of course, the only person I think that really had a kind of sense, not of Derrida, but for Derrida's popularity was um, was Jameson's, you know, on postmodernism and the logic of late capitalism, which also appeared in, in the 1980s and so forth. Um, but, you know, My point is, this is the first book where Derrida goes political. And by going political, he also ironically goes religious. He goes both politically and religious, because that dichotomy really doesn't exist in his thinking. One can argue it never existed before. I mean, basically what he's, what he's saying, if you read this text that we're talking about tonight carefully, is that the the vision of the historical political is what deconstruction is all about. It's not about language. It's not about text. It's not about the theory of representation. You know, it's it's not about you know finding a more trendy, comfortable sort of post-structuralized alternative to Heidegger. Did you say the vision of the historical political is religious? Yes, it's one and the same. And ultimately, this because it's Jewish. You know, this is where you might say Derrida's Jewishness finally comes out of the closet in this particular book. And hence the affection for Marx. You know, <clears throat> Derrida is not saying I am as a Marxist. He's saying I'm, in some sort, I am a interpreter of Marx. Deconstruction is about the spirit of Marx. Because in some ways the spirit of Marx is the key to the political, because what, what marks the spirit of Marx? It's the messianic. Now, in a later text, which we'll be reading, I can't remember if it's next week or the week after, we'll be reading his meditation, Meditations on Walter Benjamin, his critique of violence. Benjamin, the, the messianic thinker. Benjamin, the kind of messianic political, you know, visionary. One short little essay that was written after World War One, 
by a by a Marxist who is really a literary critic who, you know, becomes conflicted, particularly during the Stal uh, the uh, show trials of Stalin and what have you, but who remains Jewish to the very end. So you might say what we have in Spectres of Marx is the the effort somehow to take certain insights that he, I think, draws, you might say, pirates from Levinas. I mean, in, in, especially when he's talking about our ultimate responsibility for history. And our, you know, the ultimately, for Derrida, responsibility for history is responsibility for the other, because history is about the other. And what is the other of otherness, otherness of other? The impossible. But this is not a holy other, a gans andra, a, 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 tu, a tuotra. You know, that is basically this purely transcendent, unknowable, ultimately, uh, ultimate alterity of God. This is an alterity, an otherness of history, of history that is in process, a history that is claiming us and drawing us into responsibility every moment of time. I mean, this is, this is the Yahweh of Sinai. Not only I will be what I will be, but I will cause to happen what I will cause to happen. I will be there with you. you know, various interpretations or readings of the name of Yahweh. This is the, ins the ultimate inscription. It is the inscription that is written in the fiery tablets. Not as tablets, which are the emblem of writing. But the tablets, which are the tablets of history, what, what Derrida in this book calls the injunction. There is a disjunction, the time is out of joy, and there is a conjunction, conjunction of the radical future and the remembered past, you might say the, the meta-narrative that somehow grips us ethically and morally and politically for the present. And there is the confusion of the present. There is the absent presence. The present that is not really there because it is not it is not yet come, it is still what he calls in using the French avenir. It is still to come. But it is also it, it is it is written down, it is inscribed. It is past present, and because it is past present through this inscription, through this scriptural inscription, it makes a claim upon us, the claim of the radical future. A claim of the radical future that is not a set of imminent possibilities but of what he calls the impossible. And what is the name of this impossible future that is making a claim, an ethical, moral, political claim upon us now in our, in our own concrete historicity? It is the claim of, where it begins with a J. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Justice. <clears throat> the unnameable name that otherwise we use for justice. <laughs> oh, that was bad. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to call on Jeff. You, you had the, uh, the group tonight, right? Yes. So what are your questions? Uh, we actually have them printed out. So we were thinking of splitting, it looks like, I mean, half the group is in here, so maybe, um... <clears throat> but it's the, the, the good group is here, the group that was... Yeah. I guess what do you think? We could, we have copies of the questions for groups. They're not in a particular order, and you don't have to, like, do it in order. Just, like, whatever stands out, you can discuss with the group. Yeah, don't feel like you have to go one, two, three, four, five. That's what we were thinking of doing, is breaking up into groups and discussing it. <clears throat> 
I don't know if that's For a, minutes, a that's little unorthodox, true. but... It doesn't help with your video. No, it's, it's all right. I mean, I, I believe in groups. I'm the only person in my group. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why don't you join it? All right. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>